Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Data Diversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will be joined by guest speaker Sean Rogers to discuss improving data analytics with data governance. To just a couple of points to get us started, due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag RWDG. As we always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, Bob Seiner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, TDAN.com. Bob has been a recipient of the Damon Professional Award for significant and demonstrable contributions to the data management industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Sean. Hi, everybody else that's out there. Thank you, like always, for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend the webinar this month. Um, as Shannon said, we'll be talking about improving data analytics with data governance. And a couple times a year, I reach out to somebody that I think is really knowledgeable about the, the topic that we'll be speaking about that month, and I invite them to join us as uh, join me as their guest. And today I have um, reached into my history in data management a little bit, going back several years to a, a good friend of mine, Sean Rogers of TIBCO, and I'll introduce Sean a little bit more in a second. So um, again, thank you very much for attending the session today. I hope you get a lot out of it. And please ask questions, chat in the, in the, uh, the chat boxes on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, if it's of interest to you, it's always great how we have a lot of people engaged during the, uh, during the sessions here. Um, before we get started, a couple things I want to go over real quickly, and as all of you know, I do a data, to do this data governance webinar series, Real World Data Governance, on the third Thursday of every month. And so next month, we'll be talking about one of my favorite subjects, the non-invasive data governance framework. So if you're familiar with the book or the training or anything like that, I'm going to be sharing with you a framework for non-invasive data governance, so please register for that webinar uh, as well. And there's lots of different places that you can register for that webinar. Um, I also mentioned the book is available through your favorite bookseller, uh, the book on non-invasive data governance. I'll be speaking at actually a couple of data diversity events coming up. One is in Chicago in October. I'll be speaking at the Data Architecture Summit. And just recently, I found out that I'll be speaking at the Data Governance Winter Conference down in Delray Beach, Florida, later in the year. So um, also, there is an online learning plan about non-invasive data governance. Shannon mentioned the Data Administration Newsletter. If you're not familiar with it, go out and go out and visit tdan.com, lots of great information for people in the data space. And last but not least, KIK Consulting and Educational Services is the name of my consulting company, and that's the place that you really can go to get a lot of information about non-invasive data governance. And with that, I'd like to introduce my guest today. Uh, my guest is Sean Rogers, and Sean and I go way back, as I said before, uh, even into the early days of tdan.com. Um, Sean is the Senior Director of Analytical, Analytics Strategy at TIBCO. Um, he is known as a speaker and a thought leader and an author, has written books on the subjects that are probably pertinent to a lot of you that are on the call today. Um, he's had, got 20 plus years working in the field. Um, I'd like to introduce Sean Rogers. I think he'll be a great guest today. Sean, do you want to say hi? Bob, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. It's, um, I think that we've got a lot of great things to talk about. Um, I've been working in the data governance space a while, and I know that a lot of organizations are focusing on data analytics and improving what they can do with the data that they have. Um, and I think this is really a timely topic. Like I said, a lot of the organizations I'm working with are even situating their data governance programs within an insights and analytics or similarly named group in their organization. So there's five topics that I'm going to discuss with Sean today. The first one is we're going to talk about the relationship between governance and analytics. 
The second one is we're going to talk about getting management to understand why data governance is necessary, not only for analytics, but for other purposes within your organization. We'll talk about how to focus your data governance program on analytics. We'll talk about using the focus of analytics to bolster your data governance program. And actually, as I thought more about that, um, the same could be held in, uh, in reverse, where um, having the uh, analytics program can, or having a data governance program can certainly boost uh, analytics within your organization. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the symbiotic relationship between governance and analytics. And with that, I feel like I've been doing enough of the talking. I want to get Sean involved here in, in one second. <laughs> um, the first topic, as I mentioned, was the relationship between data governance and data analytics. And Sean, what I'd like to start out by talking to you about is you know, how do you define data governance? How do you define data analytics? I know I put a, a pretty strong definition behind the word data governance, what I call it, the execution and enforcement of authority over the management of data. Um, and so that's worded with teeth because at the end of the day, what do we need to do by putting a governance program in place? We need to execute and enforce authority. And, and, my, and a very simple definition of data analytics that I use is that, you know, basically using data in your organization to provide insights and make great decisions. Do you have definitions that you use for data governance and data analytics? And would you be uh, willing to share that with the listeners today? Well, you know, I wouldn't, Bob, I wouldn't argue with you at all about the data, defining the data governance side of this. I mean, I do think it is about execution and certainly about authority and process and, and it, and it, and, and those, those I think things have been with data governance for a real long time. The, the uh, defining of data analytics is kind of interesting because I think it's on the move just a little bit. And if I was going to expand on what you're sharing here, I definitely agree it's about the insight, you know, whereas governance is often about the data. And then I would tack on to the end of that this idea of uh, making sure that, you know, analytics is bringing you to a point of being able to take action uh, in the critical moments of your business or at the speed of your business. And certainly I think even a more sophisticated or forward-looking thought around analytics is closing the loop and learning from the actions that you're taking. And I, I don't think we're there yet. I don't meet a lot of companies that have a, a, an architecture and an organized framework that not only addresses governance and data management issues, but also takes them to this full loop of analytics on the, the insight, the action, and of course, uh, learning from the action. So yeah, but I think we're pretty close here. And um, But yeah, I've always liked the way you see data governance, so I certainly wouldn't argue with you on it. Yeah, you know, it, it seems to be, you know, data analytics seems to be what a lot of organizations are talking about is, is what types of decisions can they make, what types of actions can they take based on the information that they can find through analytical capabilities. So I've got a couple other questions to ask you about this topic as well. Um, so sure. really the first one is, is, is data governance, is it required that you have a data governance program to implement data analytics or can you implement a program without having governance around the data that the analytics is analyzing? <laughs> well, I will answer that like this. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, <laughs> okay. If you have data and you have analytics tool, any, anybody can go off and do analytics. But I think that your, your journey will be a short one if you don't have the right infrastructure, the right core or foundation to move forward. One of the things I think I've seen over the last handful of years in the market is, is that uh, data governance and analytics have become partners. They've become much closer um, than they maybe were back in the days. You know, Bob, you mentioned we've known each other a long time. And, you know, I, I, I used to, you know, the data governance space when we talked a lot about single sort of sources of information and talking about how governance affected data warehouses is a completely different conversation than we have today. And so I feel that to have maybe I'd expand on your question, to be successful with analytics and to be able to scale analytics. And I think that's another important part here. A lot of companies started doing analytics in general, but now they're all faced with this newer challenge of, well, okay, this is good. This is good for my business, but I need to pump my brakes a little bit and, and figure out how I'm going to scale. And, and I think that the demand for scale 
is created a demand for a closeness and a partnership between data governance and analytics. Do you, do you get what I'm talking about there? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And you know what? It's funny because over the years, that's kind of uh, evolved quite a bit. I mean, a lot of times with data governance was really associated with business intelligence and data warehousing, as you said. And then we've also gone through where data governance and master data management are connected at the hip, and data governance and big data were connected at the hip. I mean, so now with analytics, you know, what I'm really wondering about, is that enough to be able to take to your management to say that if we want to really improve our analytical capability, governance is something that we should be thinking about. Is that a strong enough message to take to the management? I, mean, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, but do you think that's a strong enough message? Yeah, I think it is, you know, because taking a message kind of up the, up the pole on a topic like that. Now, you just mentioned, right, I said data warehouse, you added, the, uh, added uh, data governance and big data and MDM in there. Those, those words, those topics don't always resonate with the C-level people within our businesses. They're thinking about things in a little bit different way. They become enamored with some of those bright, shiny toys of technology. And, you know, I always thought big data as a term was a bright, shiny toy, and it wasn't really well defined for business decisions. But data analytics is something that the C-suite seems to understand, you know, from, from our friend Tom Davenport writing great books about it and others, it is where ROI rests. And because return on your data investment is important to the C-suite, I think we have a really compelling story to go up and say, look, if we attach and combine or partner data governance with our data analytics and with an algorithmically driven sort of strategy, we become somewhat unstoppable in our ability to really get the monetary value from the data that we've spent so much money to curate and to bring into our businesses. You know, a lot of, a lot of executives that I meet are asking me this question of, hey, I spent $3 million on my Hadoop cluster, and it's turned into a Hadoop, and I don't really know what I'm going to get from it. And the answer, I think, is, is analytics, right? It's the ability to refine the data from these structures. And so, yeah, I mean, the short answer to your, your question is absolutely. I think the importance or criticality of data analytics coupled with good data governance makes a compelling story that the C-suite the C -suite can digest. <laughs> Okay, and you know what, I mean, it, it, we could talk about each of these questions for a long time, I think, um, but just to, along the lines of the other questions that are on the screen, I mean, is analytics the most important result of governing data? I can see that there's a lot of results from compliance and protection and all of those types of things, but is, is analytics potentially the most important result? Um, yeah, I mean, in some respects, I think it depends on the company and it depends on what's critical to them. I think it's extremely important. I do think that obviously smart data governance, uh, there's lots of benefits, and you just touched on that. So, um, but I do think, going back to the original question, I do think it's critical to scale. I think it's critical uh, to move forward with. I, we can't just get along with mediocre governance and data management today. Um, and Bob, you might, you know, you, you have a good view of this as well. I think we see ebbs and flows in our industry. You just talked about them. MDM was very important, big data, BI, data warehousing. These are the ebbs and flows that you and I have ridden for the last couple of decades around where governance and quality and compliance and, and insights all kind of live. And we're at another high point where data and analytics and algorithmically driven businesses are certainly driving people to, again, look at the criticality and importance of their data governance practices. Yeah, and, and yet there are still a lot of organizations that are, are still fighting that issue every day of getting over the hurdle with management Absolutely. to implement governance. And in fact, if any of you out there have questions or would like to ask Sean or I questions about that, please do so, uh, as uh, Shannon had mentioned, through the Q&A section. It's a, it's a really important topic, and if we can tie analytics and data governance together, I think we're all going to be a lot more successful in the organizations that we're working for. So the second point I 
wanted to talk about is, and it kind of feeds right off what we were just talk, talking about, is getting management to understand why data governance is necessary, and certainly analytics and, and analytical capabilities and where they're putting their money becomes a really important factor because they want to see return on, they want to see good return on investment. They want to see that, that better decisions and actions are being take, are taking place. You know, when I define best practices for an organization, and I'd be lying if I said that 99% of the time they use management support, sponsorship, and understanding as their first best practice because it's, it's basically 100%. I mean, organizations recognize that management needs to support, sponsor, and probably most importantly, understand what the heck it is we're doing with data governance. And, you know, the whole concept of non-invasive data governance is to strengthen and to formalize things that are already place, in place in your organizations. I would say most organizations are governing their data, but they're not doing it as formally as they'd like to, and, and therefore it, their, their processes associated with data are inefficient and oftentimes ineffective. Um, any thoughts on that before I jump into the other questions? I mean, we've already stated that it's important for uh, senior management to, to really understand this stuff. Yeah, I, th I think that's important, and I think it runs parallel to this other side of, of where, it, where, where it's getting improvement and where it's important is around this digital transformation sort of idea. Companies have been digitally transforming now for quite some time. And, you know, I mentioned scale before as to why it's sort of important to be able to put these two types of technologies together. And that's part of digitally transforming your company. But really what we're after is, is innovation. And when we're trying to innovate, you can never – innovate without having the right, you know, you can insert your word here, ammunition or core or, or stable foundation. And again, we're back to, you know, how important is it to couple these technologies together to go ahead and innovate as a company? And in that innovation, I think dovetails right off your best practice, right? You know, because if you do have those things, support and sponsorship and the engagement and understanding of your, of your stakeholders in your executive suite, they're already worried about digital transformation across the business. So I think that we play a big part here from a data analytics and governance standpoint as part of that transformation and part of the strategy for innovation for companies. And I think that that's a good message to take to the C-suite. Yeah, it is, and you're right. I mean, innovation is the key. I mean, something that differentiates your company from what your competition can do. And if it's making dis better decisions based on the data you have, that might be a clear competitive advantage. If you know what your customers are thinking, if you know, um, if, if you can track behaviors and things like that, you can model, you can predict things through modeling. It really, um, that's the direction that organizations are going. And oftentimes, I, I will say that understanding is the most important word, but if we don't have support, sponsorship, and understanding, the chances are that we're going to be at risk, and there's a lot of programs that have been at risk because of that. So can you share with me what might be some of the key messages that we can give to management to help them to improve their understanding of data governance and its impact on data analytics? I, I find that examples work the best. You know, if you want to be present with your customers or your business at key or critical business moments. I think it's, uh, I do this quite a bit where, where we'll, show, uh, we'll show one of our customers the idea of, here's probably where you're at today, but here's what the next state looks like. Here's what the next normal looks like. And we can jump the gap from here to there um, you know, in, in these three or four different steps or with this insertion of a technology and so on. And, and if you can help, I think, the stakeholders deeper in their understanding side of it by showing them where we're at today and what the present or where we can be in the close future and the impact of that, I have those conversations all the time. It's, uh, and the other thing is, is that I think when we look at governance and analytics, I think another message that tends to resonate is the ability to walk into that office and say, here, I understand the investments we've made in data, and I'm, I'm bringing to you a way to demonstrate ROI on in your investment. And that one seems to get an awful lot of uh, 
uh, of feedback from the executive suite. I, I made my little dump joke earlier, but it's true. You know, you and I, you and I do a lot of teaching. I've been on the faculty at TDWI for years, and I, I used to, I used to teach a Hadoop class, and I would ask people, how many of you are here because you have a compelling and critical big data Hadoop project? And I'd get like three hands raised in the air. How many of you are here because your CEO read Forbes magazine on the airplane last week? And every hand in the room would go up, and I'd get a lot of laughter. And, and the problem is, is that they spent a lot of money in early BI days, uh, early, you know, all through the data warehousing sort of generation. Now we have all of these other platforms, and, and I'd love to hear your thought on this, but isn't there also this issue of gravity? where we're letting data live where it needs to live instead of shuffling it around as much as we used to because of cloud and IoT and other things. And so every business I meet is having a hard time getting a return on the big data Hadoop investment, the IoT investment, and so on. We're, we're the promised land. We're the people that help them generate ROI from investment. And that's how I like to start these conversations because that's really what's important to these folks. It's not about the technology so much anymore. It's about can I put a framework together to enhance or increase or, you know, improve the return on investment from the data investment. So I, I think and that tends to get the attention. You know, it's true. I mean, so uh, you've got your distributed data, and with that comes distributed data governance. And so there's yeah. not necessarily any standardization of the data. And as you said, organizations are investing very heavily in this. And, you know, even with the, you know, you talk about the, the dump, and I talk about data lakes turning into data swamps. Okay, so people yeah. even, yeah. the idea of building the data lakes is to bring your data in there in raw fashion and give and make it available to people to, in some organizations, to focus their analytics on the data there, but it's ungoverned and it doesn't have definition and it doesn't have, I hate to use the word ownership, I should say stewardship of that data, um, that becomes a real issue. And, yes, the, the distributed nature and looking to do things on the sly and, and do things relatively inexpensively uh, and going out directly to the sources when there's no assurance that there's quality of the data in those sources and that it's not being owned or governed or stewarded properly is a real risk. And I think, that, as you mentioned earlier, you know, your program could be very short. Uh, it could have a short lifespan if the data that you're going to is not is not really governed. Um, you know, so what I would like to see is kind of, kind of tap into your experience and see, you know, have you seen any, or can you talk about any examples of organizations that have basically connected data governance and analytics at the hips? And what have been, you know, what have been some of the results? What are some of the methods? Anything that you could share with us on that? On that topic. Yeah, you know, I, I, I see it a lot in those industries, Bob, that you and I saw adopting these other technologies earlier and faster than, say, the laggards in the space. So I see it a lot in the financial services world. Um, and, you know, and, and they're doing a really great job of aligning both because they understood how accuracy um, was critical to what they were doing and how important it was for their innovation. I, I just met with um, some customers in New York recently, and that was, that was the talk I heard. The talk I heard wasn't about technology. It was about the need to innovate. And all of these folks from FSI, whether it was banking and even the insurance companies, were all starting to see the relevance or the connection between them, and they were actually starting to bring the groups together, which was, you know, I, I, I knew we were going to talk about this, and I've actually started to see a um, – uh, organizations start to knock down the walls between or the silos between these organizations and they're forcing them to work together because they're starting to see governance and data management and analytics through a single filter. Um, but uh, to answer your specific question, yeah, I think uh, the financial services organizations are doing it. Uh, I was talking to some retail banking customers recently, and of course, they're talking about all these different critical business moments that they want to be part of, whether it's, you know, mortgage applications or making the next best offer or understanding what their customers are doing. These are not, these are next generation insights and actions, and in order to get to the next generation insight or action, retail banks understand that they need to have governance, they need to have control. 
So, um, and then, you know, lastly, I think over the uh, last few months, we've seen quite a lot of, um, before May anyway, we've seen an awful lot of work on any company that's global in its existence, and there's great concern about how to govern uh, analytics and data together because of, of regulatory and compliance issues around GDPR. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would look at, go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I would look at those can you, can, industries. Go ahead. I was just going to recap, Bob, that you should look at those industries for the innovators. Financial services is a great place to see people doing things fast. Yeah, and, and sorry about interrupting you. I just tried to get to the last question, too, is, which is, you know, what have the results been when people haven't coupled governance with analytics? Have you seen uh, any situations where they're trying to use data that's not necessarily um, ready to be used? Yeah, well, I think we see those examples every day, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, that one, that one's not a surprise. Um, I do see, um, you know, and you made me think of this, is that one of the financial customers I was talking to recently made a point to me that they were being more careful about sourcing the data because the analytic had become so critical that they felt that they couldn't make mistakes anymore or do good enough analytics and good enough being well, the data is good enough, it's governed good enough, you know, it, it, they are getting very precise and part of that precision is working backwards and saying, you know, we're not going to include this in this particular analytic or this action, this insight, unless we actually can quantify and understand how good the source data is and whether or not it's going to suffice to what we want to do. So that's different. You know, I, I have to admit in the early days, Governance was always the first thing to get kind of shoved aside. That's too hard. It takes too long. It costs too much money. And I do think that the, I think the culture around governance as it's attached to analytics is really shifting. And, and you know, I always talk about non-invasive data governance. I say you're already doing governance. You're just doing it inefficiently, informally, and effectively. And you can you can formalize that, and it's a lot less threatening to your organization. And I love the idea of when the organizations get dependent on their analytics that they can be so um, they would want, they want their data to be so good, so right that it, it's going to require governance from the time that governance is brought yeah. uh, that data is brought into the organization. I mean that's a great idea. And so if the people get to the point where they're so dependent on the analytics to keep their company innovating and to stay a step ahead. Um, then you've got your business case for data governance right there, folks. I mean, you say if your company is even thinking about that, you really want to make sure that your data is right. So I, uh, I love that idea of, of them becoming so dependent on it that governance becomes really a no-brainer for your organization. And so, all right, let's move on to the next topic because, as I said, we can talk about this stuff all day. Um, we're going to talk about how to focus your governance program on analytics. And so just to kind of give you a little uh, thing about what I was thinking on this topic is that, you know, one or, a lot of organizations have a hard time identifying the people in the organization that should be held formally accountable for data. And people who have attended my webinars in the past know that I've said that basically everybody in the organization is a data steward and they, they need to get over it. Well, it really holds true for the analytics field. Anybody that's involved in bringing data in or defining or massaging data has an accountability to um, to the organization, and I think that if we can formalize that accountability, you know, we can really improve the data that's feeding our analytical capabilities. And you know, oftentimes, as we mentioned before, governance must really focus on those enterprise missions and directives. And so, take a look at folks at your mission and directives, and see what from your data, what what of them, which ones of those um, are related to improvements in information and data and, uh, and say that if we really want to do these things, how can we not even be thinking about data governance? Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, anything that you can share about how to focus your, your program on analytics itself? You know, it, it, it's interesting. I, I think I've mentioned once or twice while we were talking that there's sort of this new um, process that I see around sort of uh, being algorithmically driven. You know, back in the 90s, uh, Don Tapscott wrote this great book about, 
you know, the digital economy. And, and, the, and at the heart of Tap Scott's book, it was, hey, you better get prepared. You better be ready because this whole digital thing is going to happen with the Internet. And we're going to be all connected. And this connectedness is going to give us all this data. And it's going to be a whole brand new world and, frankly, a whole brand new economy. And I think Tap Scott was right when he wrote that book. But I think what's also happened since he wrote the book in, like, 96, he also, what we've also seen is, is we've gone through sort of a shift around the data economy. And we got waylaid again about, you know, how are we managing it? How are we governing it? Let's just go get all of it. And that took place for quite some time. And I think now we're coming out of, of this data ideal and we're heading towards this algorithm economy. And an algorithm or an analytic economy, whichever word you prefer, is really where companies are starting to entrench themselves in all of the things that they've been doing. And so I find that that's a conversation or a premise for projects or an ideal that will resonate with a larger, broader team in any environment. And so from a how do you get the attention of folks about why to couple this is, is because you can't participate in the algorithm economy without pure data, without governed data, and without systems at the analytic edge that will help you do those things. But the bottom line is, is these now go very much hand in hand, much more so, I think, than some of the other things. And it's partially driven, Bob, by precision, because in our BI days, if I gave you a report that was lightly governed, that, you know, was pretty close in overall revenue sold in my western region, that was generally good enough. But if you're going to interact in a one-to-one -one relationship with somebody or some service or some process, you have to be precise. And that precision, I think, is driving the new need. And I think that that's something that I would spend time talking to upper management and, and enablers of these projects. I love that statement. I wrote down algorithm uh, economy, and I put big stars next to it because it's. And I might have to borrow that from you. Of course, tell the people where I heard it first. But I mean, <laughs> it, it, if it, especially if it gives them an opportunity, and oftentimes it'll it'll get them to ask questions and say, um, "What do you mean by algorithm economy?" And if that, that's an open door right there to explain to them, you know, why this is so critical to make certain that we're successful in all the ways that we want to be successful. So that's that's a great term. I had never heard a dump before. I had never heard uh, algorithm economy. I, I really like those ideas. But you know, okay. so we talked about this. We talked about this a little bit earlier about data governance with business intelligence and data warehousing and metadata and MDM. Um, is how, or maybe I should ask the question: How is data governance different for analytics than it would be for any of your other types of data integration projects? Are, you, are there things that you need to include that you wouldn't include for, say, a traditional implementation? Uh, and now this is becoming traditional at this point, but you know, one of the older traditional uh, ways of, of leveraging your data. Well, you know, I I, I think that that tends to happen around, I guess the word that comes to mind for me that might be different is this focus on having a more diverse sort of set of practices and capabilities and people. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking back to your earlier question about who's innovating and where am I seeing these use cases, and I mentioned FSI and retail banking as a couple of them. Almost everyone that's doing that work is bringing together the teams in ways that I haven't seen in the past. And it's not just the teams, but it's also the technology. So when you touch on things like MDM, or if I added, say, catalogs to that, or, you know, or data virtualization and governance, most companies now are sort of bringing all guns to bear on the battle. But in order to do that, they are actually bringing different teams together. Early on in my career, in, especially in the BI space, it was like, well, we need a report that tells us X, and someone would say, great, well, let's spec out what we want to know, and then we'll throw it over the wall to the data guy. And it, it was siloed, and it wasn't super efficient because we all know the joke, you know, the data guys would help them build what they need, and they'd show them X, and, of course, business would come back and say, that's great. Can I also have Y, please? 
and that, and, and it was a it was a great example for the need for collaborative sort of interfaces here. And I guess that's where I'll end my my answer is is diversity is the key to success in people and in technology. And the finishing point here is is the ability to collaborate towards what's truly valuable, what drives growth, and a more sophisticated approach to things. So that's what the the leaders in the market are doing right now. They're knocking down the silos. They're not throwing it to the data guy anymore. They're partnering with data experts, governance experts, MDM people, and the business in a way that you and I used to write articles about years ago that, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we could get to this? And and I think, I think just because of the need to innovate and the ability to do things we couldn't do before from a, a technology standpoint, I really do believe that the walls are getting knocked down, and I think that that's a big difference in what we see going forward. And, you know, I know that a, uh, a friend of both of ours, David Lotion, wrote a book on the savvy business intelligence manager. And, you know what, they're becoming more and more savvy uh, and technology aware and able to use the technology. So it is becoming um, really important, more important to the organization as these folks, as it's no longer, like you said, tossing it over the wall and hoping that you get something back. Because the problem is if you toss it over the wall to two different people, if the data is ungoverned, you're probably going to get two different answers, and that's not really acceptable to a lot of organizations either. So we're going to jump on to our next to last topic. Um, let's talk about using um, using the focus on analytics. So, and I think we touched on this a little bit earlier as well. We touched on a lot of things, but um, using the focus on analytics to improve the value and improve data governance within the organization. So, I mean, a couple things I'd like to do is really draw that connection. And I think we've done it partially. Um, um, draw the connection between governance and the improved analytical capabilities. And then, you know, again, I'm trying to look for, well, what were some of the results of organizations that have tried to do analytics and their data has been ungoverned? I mean, do they, do you find that they often recognize the failure or recognize the need to improve the data so they go back and implement governance? Or is it just a failure and they just move on? I, I can't see the latter happening. No, no, not for not not at all. And and you know, to touch on your first piece, you know, this dotted line between governance and analytics. I think if I again, I, I've been giving you words to me that mean a lot to me when I have these conversations. And I think maybe I'm back to the real the real dotted line. Can, you know, there could be innovation, but that's a little ambiguous. There can be use cases. There can all be all these different things. But doesn't it ultimately get down to our capability to be precise? And part of that precision is what's really driving kind of what's, I don't know, I don't know if it's broken, but it's certainly something that a lot of companies are trying to figure out. I, 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 got, I, I got an interesting story when I was early in my career from a mutual friend of ours, I suspect, Dr. Richard Hackathorn. And Hackathorn told sure. me this great story about he said, you know, Mary sent her son to the market on the corner in New York, and when, she, when the boy ran into the market, there was an order, you know, a basket of bread and some other things that Mary usually bought each week, and, and the boy was there to pick it up. But in the same instance, the person who ran the store also had the capability of saying, hey, you know, that mustard your mother likes just came in. I put a bottle of it in the bag, and I'll put it onto her account. And also just let her know that, you know, what she, the dresses that she'd like to purchase are going to be, you know, be here next week. And in it, 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 on, a, on the surface, it's not, you know, it's like, okay, what's the point of the story? And the point is, is that he had a one-to-one -one shopping experience with a customer. He extended credit on the fly and actually discussed with them in a real useful way his uh, inventory supply chain. <laughs> so Dick Hackathorn right. made the point, Dick made the point of how do we scale that to a billion people or a million people or to other critical experiences. And so it's about precision and it's about moving at the speed of whatever the business is. You can't do either if you don't have governance and the right analytics and opposing sides. So the short answer to your piece there is, I think precision is something that a lot of executives can understand. One-to-one -one is something executives understand, and they know it's the holy grail of interaction, whether it's with customers or supply chains or making credit decisions. It, it doesn't matter. It's that one-to-one -one part that is the new hurdle to jump, and you can't jump it the old way. 
So and you know what? We, we live it every day. Yeah, right? You know, and it, I think, it impacts us every day, right? Yeah, and we're starting to expect it, right, Bob? I mean, I'd be a little put off if Netflix didn't tell me what to watch next. You know, I'd be, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be stunned. You know, I expect that level of service. I'd be mad at Amazon if they didn't say, hey, we saw you bought a blue golf shirt, a pair of khakis would go nice with that. I expect it. <laughs> and, and that's my, I think your second question was, well, what happens if we fail or what happens if that doesn't work? And I think what we end up affecting terribly is in the area of context and trust with the people that were, or the processes or the vendors that we're working with. So if I can't be precise, I can't keep my analytics in the pocket of being contextually good, right? It would be silly of Amazon to offer me a dress. It would be silly of Netflix to offer me a type of movie I've never watched before. So the context part becomes really important, which is completely 100% dedicated to the governance of the data that's feeding that process. And if you screw that up, you screw up trust. And the more you screw up trust with your customers or your processes or what have you, the more likely you are not to achieve the innovation that you're looking for. So for me, the dotted line is precision. For me, the downside of failure is going to be ruining context, ruining trust, and, and, and eventually you know, not being able to innovate. You know what I mean? I think that we've we've all become so used to living at it, living that way, and having things brought to our attention through the analytics that are done with our data. Um, right. That again, if we don't trust what it is that they're telling us, or if it's not accurate, we're not going to go to that. In fact, we're going to shut it off. But if we see value to it, then we're going to continue to do it. Um, I had one more question on this subject too uh, before we jump into the last sub last subject, and that are is really has to do. And I know you're pretty active in the, the focus on um, the technologies, but can you share with the uh, attendees today, the participants today, what are some of the new technologies that people should be looking for when it comes to analytics for their organization? Well, yeah, there's, there's a few. I, you know, you've, you've heard everybody, I think we've talked about real-time or right-time analytics for a very long time or streaming analytics, and I always felt like, you know, especially a few years ago, we were still talking future tense, but I, I do think that the time has arrived. I, I find that the large, uh, a large propensity of the customers and users that I interact with are looking to solve a variable sort of uh, group of problems that are pursuant to the data. And so they have data that's at rest, they have data that's in, on the move, and the on the move data has become a lot more interesting to customers in general because it allows you to fuel critical business moments in a, in a, at the speed of a business. And so if that's important to a customer, they're starting to look at that as, as a trend. You know, Bob, there's a ton of talk about, you know, where ML, uh, ML and AI fit, and that's a very sophisticated approach to advanced analytics, right. this idea right. of being able to predict what's going to happen in your business instead of looking at it historically. And, and, you know, I always like to make the point that the math behind all of this is not new. What, what is new is, is that a handful of drivers have come home, and I think everyone on today's call probably feel these drivers. And if you think about it, these are probably true. You're probably trying to serve a much larger and more diverse community of users through governance and data towards analytics. They're more demanding and they're unafraid of the applications. There's this Google generation that's showing up in the workplace with an expectation of using insights to take action. So the community has gotten bigger. At the same time, the economics have shifted. And the economics shift that I'm just pointing out is, is that there's things like open source and there's ways to do things now at a price point that literally we couldn't do years ago. The first big data project I ever witnessed was one on the East Coast where they were doing the genome and it was government funded. <laughs> and it was, it was the only way to crunch that much data. Now I can crunch that much data on my laptop. So there's an economic advantage. Then there's this technology advantage. When we look at things like Hadoop and, and big data and open source languages like R and others, they're helping customers innovate and they're disrupting from a technology standpoint. And then the last part, which is very close to our conversation, is we now have all the data. 
not just most of the data, we can have it all. It just depends, different companies, different goals, but bottom line is, whatever data you need, you can have. I remember writing articles in DM Review Magazine years ago about isn't it peculiar that we make all of these critical business decisions on 20% of the data and the other 80% is highly unstructured, uncurated, ungoverned, and it's not something that we can bring into our systems. Well, here we are today. Companies can have all their data. So if you have all your data, you have technology disrupting your workplace, you have a bigger community of users and an economic advantage, things are going to shift and I think that that's, you know, that's part of this conversation right now is this is what's helping us make changes. Yep, yeah, and it's just becoming more and more important and not only is it becoming cheaper for organizations to be able to do that and it's more readily available, just the whole idea of just-in-time analytics and making the right decisions. So like when somebody enters a specific store and they've got specials that are customized specific to the person and those are sent out to them because they know the history and they can predict what somebody's behavior is. I remember years ago working for a large supermarket chain here in Pittsburgh that was doing some of these things. It was noticing when people bought X, they also bought Y. So they could increase the price on one and decrease the price on the other and advertise the decreased price and they, they wouldn't they, they would have the same or better profit margin. I mean, people have been using data to do all these things, and it's just becoming more and more of a differentiating factor for, for organizations. So again, all you folks that are, uh, are attending today, if data analytics is really important to you, then this is really the justification to make sure that we get the data right and that we, and we have that sense of precision that Sean talked about. Um, the last topic that we want to talk about is kind of a summary talk topic, and it's talking about kind of, I talked about it being a symbiotic relationship between governance and analytics, and I want to make sure I understood what symbiotic meant. It sounded good at the time, but, you know, it's kind of the interdependent relationship between these subjects. Um, you know, you really need to successfully govern your data. I think we've made a very big point of that in this, uh, in this webinar, and, and you've given a lot of great examples of how organizations can really maximize the value of their data and of their analytics, but it comes down to getting the data right. And, you know, if we think about how much time people spend, you, you use the 80-20 rule in a different way, but I, I always say that, you know, we spend 80% of our time doing, you know, what we need to do to get the data ready so that we can do 20% of our of what our, our job tells us to do. Well, wouldn't it be better if we had the data and that we trusted the data and that it was governed and that we had the metadata? All these things that date back to the beginning of, at least the beginning of data management time from the time I was uh, involved, which seems to be a whole lot of years. So um, anything else that you can share to kind of summarize the relationship between these two topics? You know, I, I will say that I, I feel, you know, I'm going to join you on the old end of the pool, Bob. I feel, <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like I witnessed a transition around the conversation about data governance and, and even just data management in general. But data governance was often a nice to have, not through my eyes, but through the eyes of a lot of customers I knew and I met. And, and, and it was always, I always felt early on that we were always trying to convince people how important this is, that it wasn't a nice to have, it was a have to have. And that's why I brought up ebbs and flows earlier today, because I, I think there's been times when pressure has been applied where a lot of, uh, you know, uh, managerial or executive level folks have gone, okay, okay, I'll give you a little bit more headcount, let's hire a steward, let's do this, let's do that. But they never <laughs> liked it because it was, it was always hard to explain in the boardroom. They could never tell anybody why they were investing there instead of the newest bright, shiny toy. Now, the bright, shiny toy is actually coupled to and dependent upon great data governance. So right. great data governance right. and analytics go hand in hand. And I think for the first time, I, mean, you, I think you could admit, Bob, that big data and data governance did not go hand in hand, right? You know, no, it, 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 there's certainly an application there, but it certainly, it wasn't winning the fight in the boardroom. You know, they weren't saying, I want to build a data lake and I also want to enable it with data great data governance, <laughs> it just wasn't happening. So oh, well, now we're at a point yeah, where this. Yeah, you know what, in big data, I think that you, you alluded to the fact earlier that big data 
as a, as a discipline was never really that well nailed down. It could be, mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And now that we're looking at analytics and being able to make better decisions and take better actions around the data, um, it, it, so it's really become a non-brainer, a no-brainer, uh, no should I say. Just like compliance and protection of data is a no-brainer. Well, you know, you need to make sure that people are following the rules associated with the data. Well, the same thing holds true for getting the data the way that it needs to be for you to be able to do uh, successful analytics. So if there's one message that you want the attendees to take back with them after this webinar, is there one, is it, can you summarize it down to one message? and then we'll get into my last question here in a second. I, I would say the message would be is the next time an initiative's put forth for data governance, the first question, the first demand that should come from a data governance team is how will we interact with analytics? Are they on the team too? Who do I talk to? Who's my partner here? And if someone says, well, we just, you know, we, we haven't figured that part out. I would slam on the brakes and skid as hard as I can. I, I mentioned diversity before. I mentioned teaming and collaboration. I do think that this is the new way that we're going to do things going forward. And so if your company is dragging its feet a little bit and doesn't quite see the synergy yet, I think you have to help them by demanding that you bring the right team together, not just a, a bunch of people that understand data, but people that understand the business challenge and understand what they want to do in the critical business moment and have all of those people convene to do things. And, and I think that that's one of the, the most important, I urge, I, I urge companies to do that all the time. Don't do it like you've always done it. Do it this new way. Put a diverse team together of stakeholders so everybody understands what they need to get. And you know what, it means a lot more work for us folks that are focused on data governance because we need to get the data right. And it's, we're just not there at this point. So, you know, getting to the last question that I have on here, and this has been a pretty serious subject. I've seen a lot of comments from people, you know, in regards to, um, you know, the importance of this subject and how they've enjoyed the conversation and I've enjoyed the conversation. But I kind of threw it out there for you and said, and I said, you know, can you share some lyrics of a song that, that <laughs> best represent the relationship between data governance and data analytics? Just something for people to remember as they're leaving the session well, today. I thought I had a good one, but I'm watching the chat, and I think Ray may have <laughs> bridge over troubled water. Um, it's also one of my favorite uh, songs, Ray, so thanks. But you know, when you and I were talking a week ago about some of the slides, that lean on me jumped into my head immediately when I, when I realized it. Because I do think we're leaning on each other to be successful there. And it was kind of funny, I actually looked up lean on me this morning, you know, and it's by Bill Withers, and, and I'm sure we've all heard the song, but you know, the first couple of lines is sometimes in our lives we'll have pain. We'll have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always a tomorrow. And uh, you guys can go read the rest of the lyrics on your own, but I thought that the first, the first four lines were pretty appropriate to our conversation. There's work to be done, there's challenges, but it's, it's, I, I like it. If we lean on each other, I think there's value to be had. Okay, and so you know what, I think we, we've taken up a bunch of time here. We want to get to the uh, the questions that people have. I was going to say love and marriage. We can't have one without the other. They really need to be together. So these are the things that we talked about today. And with that, what I'd like to do is I'd like to turn it back to Shannon because I think we've got a few questions today. Bob, thank you, and thanks, Sean, for joining us for this great presentation. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder to all registrants, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, uh, so diving right in here, data governance structurally should um, belong to business teams or IT teams? I got a oh, question. Bob, I got to answer that, Sean. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if I want to tackle that one. I, 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 I don't do enough research around where data governance functions at its highest level. And I'm sure there's people on the call today that might have, you know, opinions there, Bob. You may as well. I, I, I don't know which org it belongs to, um, but I do know that there has to be a bridge. I do know that there has to be a partnership. I, I guess off the top of my head, I... I wonder if there's an advantage to it being closer to business than to IT these days because it's so enabling to the goals of business. 
And that might be an interesting thing to, to take a deeper look at. I don't know, Bob, what, what do you think? Is it, yeah, what when, is it I, when people say, when, when people ask me if it should reside in business or in IT, I answer the question, yes. I say yeah. it, needs to, it needs to reside somewhere. It needs to be a partnership between business and IT. So I, you know, it, it has to, yeah, I think the business is the place that most people will say that data governance should live. But I have seen it successful running out of IT as long as it wasn't viewed as being an IT project for IT's sake, that it was really a partnership with the business. So I really think that it is that bridge, as somebody just stated, a bridge between business and IT, sometimes in shared services, but, you know, there, it could reside somewhere, but it needs to be somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Well, then, I mean, who um, – well, to you just expand on that, you know, who should be the leader all, um, within that? Sean, you want to take a shot? Sure. I, I see – well, you know, the leader of a governance practice is going to be somebody that has the skill set and understanding of exactly how that works and, and, and how to move forward with it. Um, what I am seeing, though, is a lot of co-leading around this idea of, of these, these analytic projects. We're seeing a lot of customers that are doing centers of excellence for analytics. And part of the center of excellence then includes people from data governance, people from data management, and there's a lot of co-leading going on there. So that I think that's kind of the, the new thing. I don't think that, you know, I would say there's one place or another. I think the governance function is always best driven by people who understand that challenge, but they have to be able to bridge the gap. They have to be able to work with the other teams. And I think the companies that are embarking on centers of excellence are showing great examples of how combining diversity in a team is getting them the best thing. There's interesting reading out there for you folks around the systems of insight that's published by Forrester, you know, one of the analyst firms. And uh, we at TIPCO follow that quite a bit. We think that there's an awful lot of good things in their infrastructure and framework. And when you go off and look at the system of insight, you'll notice that they have analytic engines right next to data governance and those types of tactics from the very beginning in their framework. So a great reading by Brian Hoskins, their analyst who writes on this. I recommend that you take a peek at it when you get a chance. Okay, and, and I say that you know, if you have a strategic level of your governance program of a data governance council and analytics is involved in that, that oftentimes I see analytics kind of take the governance program and that's why I'm seeing it reside more and more in within those types of groups within an organization. And, uh, you know, I, there was some uh, comments earlier from the, from the previous question. Uh, uh, additional song su select, uh, suggestions where I fell into a burning ring of fire. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I can't get my eyes off you. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, there's no more questions. Everybody's got it. You guys explained it so well. There's, there's just no more questions coming in. Um, <laughs> it's kind of quiet today. <laughs> but you guys, thank you so much for this great uh, presentation. It has been fabulous. Love the dialogue. Sean, thank you again for joining us. And just a reminder again to everybody, we'll send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording and, of course, to many of the um, templates that Bob offers up. So I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, thanks Sean. Sean. Thanks, thanks, Shannon. Thanks, uh, Sean. Uh, good talking to you guys. You're welcome. It was great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Sean. Bye.